Hello, and welcome to Blockchain Fundamentals with Bill Laboon. In this series of lectures, we'll talk about what blockchain is, how it works, and what it's good for. In today's lecture, we're going to discuss what I think of as the prehistory of modern blockchain technology, the different technologies and developments that led up to the first modern cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. So even though blockchain can be used for many things other than just currency, I think it behooves us to really spend some time thinking about currency since that definitely was the first use case uh, for blockchain. So let's assume I want to create my own digital currency, some bill bucks. What characteristics does a currency need to have? Well, for anything to be useful as money, it needs to be durable. It can't be something that just washes away uh, or is very easy to destroy, that biodegrades in your pocket, etc. It needs to be portable. I need to be able to take it from one place to another and spend it. It's not much use to me if it only can be stored in one place and it is very, very difficult to move. It needs to be divisible. That is, if I have a $5,000 bill, but I want to buy something that only costs $1, I need some way to get change for that or somehow divide the money that I have so that I can buy the smaller things that I want. It needs to be uniform. That is, one bill buck should not be different from another bill buck in any meaningful way. I shouldn't really care if I got a bill buck with serial number 13721 and a bill buck with serial number 17322. There has to be a limited supply. If it's something that is infinite or practically infinite, uh, then there's really no use in using it as, as money. If uh, I can buy something with leaves from the forest or sand from the uh, beach, then people aren't going to want to accept it. There needs to be some sort of limitation in supply. And finally, it must be generally acceptable. There may be things that are very rare and meet the other criteria here. So for example, leaves from a very specific oak tree in my backyard, but nobody is going to accept those very specific oak leaves from my backyard uh, as a currency. So there are a few different ways to try to create a monetary system. You can have a credit-based system that's based on debt. So that is, while the money itself isn't useful for anything, it shows that there's been some sort of work done on my behalf and that you then owe me for uh, doing that work. Whereas what we think of as a cash system is where there's some external medium of exchange. So something like you know, gold or silver, where it's not though somebody owes you some gold or owes you some silver, you actually can have gold and silver and keep it in your pocket. So while there are no perfect solutions uh, to money, lots of different societies have come up with different ways to use money and use different mechanisms. For cash-based systems, a variety of physical objects were found uh, which met this need. So for instance, as I've already mentioned, silver and gold, probably the most popular and well-known, but also cowrie shells or wampum, glass beads, uh, Federal Reserve notes that you get uh, from uh, the government, all of these act as cash. But it turns out that while a debt-based system, since you're really just keeping track of who owes whom, might be relatively easy to uh, manifest in digital form, having a cash-based system turned out to be very difficult. However, this didn't stop people from trying. Uh, first was first virtual. So in here, you would give your credit card information to the first virtual company, and they would purchase things for you on different sites. So this turned out to be rather problematic, uh, especially because merchants had to wait 90 days for every transaction to be cleared. A broader system called the set architecture uh, would actually allow you individually to encrypt your credit card number and send an encrypted version through an intermediary. So the seller would never actually see your credit card information. Uh, the buyer-seller and this intermediary would come to an agreement uh, without the actual end user 
seeing the, your actual credit card number. However, this didn't succeed because getting a certificate, uh, a, crypto, a crypto certificate in the 90s was a very boring and technical and uh, difficult process. So cash, one of the other problems with cash is that it needs to be bootstrapped. That is, we need some way for people to agree that this silver, this, shiny, this particular shiny metal is worth something, or gold, or cowrie shells. Um, but cash had a lot of benefits to these credit-based systems that were tried at first. First, cash has no risk of default. If I have three ounces of gold in my pocket, nobody can say to, to me, well, that gold is now worthless. So if I assume that, that people are still accepting gold, I don't have to worry that, well, somebody else owes me gold, so I, I might not actually have the gold that I thought. If I have it in my pocket, I have it. Um, credit by its nature is not anonymous or pseudonymous. It's very easy to track anyone using this because you need to know who you owe what to. Finally, with credit, you always need to be online. You, know, you need to check with some authority uh, or be willing to deal with people who may not uh, be 100% on the level. Whereas with cash, if I go to a store, I don't have to worry when I buy some gum with my, my dollar that, uh, that I'm not actually gonna have the dollar, that person is definitely going to get the dollar, and nobody needs to know that I'm buying that gum. Cash is, for all intents and purposes, uh, anonymous. So the first, what we might think of as a modern uh, proposal for digital money was Chalmian eCash. So this all started from a famous uh, cryptographer, David Chalm, uh, who came up with this idea of blind signatures. So a blind signature allows someone to sign a document, prove that they own that document, that they, they were the one who wrote it, but not reveal any of the knowledge of what is in the document. So you could prove cryptographically, that you own some money at a bank um, by just by signing a transaction. But you didn't have to show anything about that particular money. So this was anonymous, but it still quite required centralization. Uh, it was commercialized as something called DigiCash, uh, which was tried out, uh, but uh, the company later went bankrupt. So the, here we see the first early starts at using cryptography to secure our money, although it was still linked in with the uh, traditional banking system. The reason it had to be linked in to this traditional banking system, that is having some central authority, is due to what we call the double spend issue. So let's assume that you uh, or Alice has an e-cash note. So you have some note that says that you own $1, and its serial number is OX86 whatever. Alice goes and buys a hot dog from Bob. So she says here, I, I own this bill, serial number OX86 whatever, and Bob gives her a hot dog in exchange for it. So she gives Bob uh, the bill. But Bob does not have access to the internet at this time. So he has, uh, he has just accepted that Alice has given the note. He can show that Alice uh, can, has permission to send it to him, and she sends it to him. Alice then goes over to Carol's ice cream shop. She pays with the same note as Bob, or that, that uh, she paid to Bob. How can Carol know that this note has already been spent? And how can Bob know that this bill will never be spent by Alice again. So this is something called the double spend issue. And traditionally, we thought that a centralized authority would be necessary to make sure that an individual person did not spend the same bill in multiple places. It is very, very difficult to do without a centralized source of truth. So in the DigiCash proposal, uh, the Xiaomi and eCash that we mentioned earlier, this was done after the fact. So all of the merchants would get together and would make sure that there was no double spend. If there was a double spend, thanks to the intricacies of the math uh, in the Chaum uh, Fiat Noor scheme, uh, your identity was always safe. It could be entirely, you could be entirely anonymous unless you tried to redeem your uh, uh, note multiple times. In that case, your identity was uh, given to them. 
On the other hand, the problem with this is you have already gotten away with your hot dog and ice cream. You would have to wait until after the fact to determine if a double spend was taking place. And after the fact might be you know, days afterwards, by which time there's no getting your hot dog and ice cream back. The other problem with Chowmein eCash is that while buyers were anonymous, merchants were not. If you wanted to accept this eCash, then you would have to give your identity away because they would have to check with the centralized bank service to determine the validity of the notes. So just because it was called eCash, it really was a sort of pseudo debt. To get the money, you were buying it from the bank. It represented a claim on the bank's assets. So there are a variety of other systems that use the same basic idea, such as Liberty Reserve and DigiGold, or if you've read Neil Stevenson's novel Cryptonomicon, the cryptocurrency that they were trying to produce, it always represented a claim on some other asset. The digital uh, concept didn't have the, uh, the digital representation did not have value in and of itself. It represented some claim on some other asset. So now let's think how we could do that. How could we get something that was not a claim on some other asset, but had value in and of itself? Well, remember when we first started talking about what money had to have in order to be considered money, uh, we needed scarcity. Something needed to be of limited supply. And what can computers do? Right? Well, computers can do computational work. And if something is of, a, of limited supply, it means you have to work to get it. Gold is worth money because it's rare and it's difficult to get to. Uh, you don't just see walking around the streets here, you know, gold uh, on, on the corner or uh, uh, you know, gold growing from trees, right? The old saying, money doesn't grow on trees. So we can't find physical objects that are rare in the computational world, in the digital world. Why? Because it's trivial to copy things. If I tell you that uh, you know, here is a, a movie or an image, it's very easy for it to be copied hundreds, thousands, or millions of times, as a lot of different media companies discovered early in the 21st century. But could we use computation itself rather than just storing particular values? Could we use computation as a backing for our currency? So could we use the fact that a computer can do work to find uh, you know, results of an equation or a calculation and use that as an actual backing of our currency instead of a representation of something that exists in the physical world? So this was the idea uh, behind a, a paper in 1992, which later got expanded into a commercial product known as Hashcash. So while Hashcash uh, wasn't useful as a general purpose digital currency, uh, it did see some use as a way of spam prevention. So while machine learning has made spam prevention much less of a problem than it was in the 90s, in the 90s it was a very, very big issue. So the idea behind Hashcash was, let's say I want to send an email to somebody. Right, uh, right now, and even then, it requires minimal computational uh, power to, to do that. But what if we, you had to do some extra you know, useless computation in order to send an email to somebody? So Alice, let's say Alice wants to send Bob an email. Before Bob can see it, his computer sends a message back to Alice that says, hey, solve this math problem, you know, this complicated math problem first, you know, show that you're doing some work, and uh, send me the answer, and then I'll view it. So each of these calculations were specific to the specific email that you sent and to the specific address. So this provided rate limiting, where it might be very easy for someone to send a million spam messages Right? What if every time you sent a spam message, in order to know that that uh, message was received by the recipient, you had to have your computer spend five minutes working on a math problem? Well, now the prospect of sending email gets much more uh, expensive, right? Because sending things via uh, email, uh, both solving math problems, means that you are not going to be able to send emails so fast unless 
you spend more money on computers and electricity and networks, etc. So this basic idea of there are math problems and you'll get some reward for solving them is going to be integral to the making of Bitcoin and many of the uh, modern uh, blockchain systems. You're going to have to do some work your, or your computer will have to do some work in order to get something in return. So Adam Back, the creator of Hashcash, uh, made a sort of glib remark uh, that I think really sort of hits the mark though, is that Bitcoin is Hashcash extended with inflation control. So some additional things came from this, but we can already see we're getting to the idea of uh, a modern cryptocurrency. So if we imagine that instead of you doing the specific work every time you wanted to send an email, if you could offload that work to someone else, pay for it, just like nowadays we pay to run a server in the cloud. And then if you had some currency backing that, you're paying for these computational resources. So again, we're not exactly at a modern cryptocurrency, but we're getting very close. Meanwhile, a second problem was trying to be solved uh, in, the, in the 80s and 90s on the concept of ledgers. So how do we determine the order or uh, what time a document was created in a decentralized manner? That is, without checking in uh, to uh, you know, some centralized server. Now, you may see this in you know, old movies about ransom where you, know, you would say, hey, put today's newspaper in front of the, uh, you know, and take a, take a picture. But all that really says is this picture was taken sometime after that newspa uh, newspaper was released. It doesn't provide a very you know, easy, computationally feasible way of doing this, and it certainly can be fooled in a variety of ways. But if we can figure out that document D sub one was written before D sub two, and D sub two was written before D sub three, we can have a good idea of when that document was written. So if I know that a document was written sometime after 1776, but it was written uh, before the, the, after the Declaration of Independence of the United States, but I know that it was written uh, before Lincoln's Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address in 1863, then I can have a good idea of when that document was written, sometime between 1776 and 1863. Yeah. Uh, and we'll definitely know the order if I know that the Declaration of Independence was written first, and then our document, and then Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. So how can we enforce that order? How can we make sure that we have a list that says that this was created after, this document was created after this document, and this document was created after this document? If we could do that, we would have a chain of documents. And it turns out, using cryptography, we can. So we can provide a signature that shows uh, what the last document was. We can make a cryptographic signature of each of uh, the documents and have them point to the previous document. Turns out this is a very inefficient way uh, to store this, we, and we usually don't need that much granularity. So what we could do is get a bunch of documents, say created in the same day, and then only have this signature link go from block to block. So in other words, we now have a chain of blocks, or as we now call it today, a blockchain. So if we think of a blockchain in terms of documents, we have a collection of documents here, and each group of documents has their own signature, and it points back to the previous document, list of documents, the previous block. If we then make sure that these links are very difficult computationally to make, and thus they're going to be very difficult for someone else to create a fake version of, we can do this with this hash cash style proof of work. This is more of a Bitcoin style blockchain. We just replace the documents with transactions. So now we have a blockchain that uses hash cash style proof of work and uses this uh, chain of documents idea that was created in a decentralized way and together create something like Bitcoin. All right, so now we've seen two different uh, schools of thought or two different technologies that are really sort of coming together in order to create the modern blockchain. So can this resolve our major issue of digital currency, the double spend issue? 
So if we assume that this computationally difficult blockchain to produce is the ground truth, there's no longer a need for a centralized server. So if somehow we can get everybody to agree on the rules and the first person to be able to generate one of these links uh, is going to be considered sort of the winner and thus the creator of truth, then we don't need any sort of person to decide who is the, the arbiter of which is the correct chain of blocks. So there were several early proposals using this scheme, such as B-Money and BitGold. In both of these uh, schemes, you had computational challenges that mapped to creating money, uh, but there was no real way to determine what happens if different users uh, disagreed on blocks. Bitcoin brought all of this together. So I, one of the things that I hope you can see from this, uh, this series of lectures, and especially this lecture, is that Bitcoin did not spring fully formed uh, you know, just like Athena out of the forehead of Zeus, but rather there were a lot of different ideas floating around that Bitcoin really put together in a way that worked. So Bitcoin is the first modern cryptocurrency, although there are a lot of other cryptocurrencies uh, uh, out there. Uh, last I looked at CoinMarketCap, there were something over 2,500 of them. But Bitcoin, still the most valuable and still the oldest and still the first modern cryptocurrency. It's decentralized. There is no central arbiter. There is no CEO of Bitcoin, which means that there is no way to censor transactions. There is no way for someone to decide that they don't want you sending money to a particular address. On the downside, of course, this means that a lot more power is given to the hands of the users. There is also nobody to go uh, and talk to if you accidentally send money to s somewhere else or to the wrong person. All transactions in Bitcoin are signed cryptographically, which means they're protected by math. Blocks get added to the blockchain with proof of work. That is this hash cash style idea of you know, doing computations. Uh, and then those who do add new blocks get rewarded every time they add a block with Bitcoin. So what this means is that you are incentivized to do this work to create new blocks because you will get uh, Bitcoin if you are the person uh, or computer who is able to add a new block to this. This has led to a bit of a red queen's race where more and more people are competing for Bitcoin, uh, which means that there are huge uh, warehouses that are just filled with, filled with computing equipment that is being used to try to generate these blocks. So when you hear about somebody talk about mining Bitcoin, really what they're doing is they're trying to produce blocks by solving these really, being the first to solve these really complex uh, and difficult uh, equations and eventually uh, getting, uh, getting a, producing a new block which is going to give them the ability to accept some Bitcoin as a consequence of that. So who's behind Bitcoin? Well, we're not exactly sure. Bitcoin was created by someone with a pseudonym, Satoshi Nakamoto. So something to note, Satoshi Nakamoto, it's a male Japanese name, but there's no evidence that they're male, female, some sort of collective, that if they're Japanese, uh, anything. We know very, very little about Satoshi Nakamoto. Despite a few people claiming to be them or know who they uh, might be, uh, there has been no firm definitive evidence. Satoshi interacted with people online uh, for a few years, then went entirely dark. There are many different theories on his true identity, but again, nobody knows who exactly he, she, or they are. If you're interested in reading more about what Satoshi Nakamoto shared, there's a great book called The Book of Satoshi, uh, edited by Phil Champagne, which uh, collected the most important things that he said online during the few years, during the early days of Bitcoin that he was online. So did we resolve the double spend issue? And the answer is yes. So with Bitcoin, remember, generating a link to the previous block and a new block is a very, very difficult process and creates money. But we can come up 
with a rule that we can figure out which is the correct chain by which has the most proof of work behind it. So this was changed from the very early days of Bitcoin due to some loopholes uh, that were discovered. Uh, but the basic idea is whichever chain, whichever uh, link shows that the most work was done in creating these blocks is going to be the one that's considered valid. So the only way for you to try to censor a transaction is to spend a lot of money trying to say that there is a new uh, uh, chain of blocks. And since you are competing with everybody else in the world who is trading Bitcoin, and there are a lot of people doing that and a lot of computational be be power behind it, it turns out to be basically impossible. So this is what miners are doing. And this concept of adding miners and rewarding them for generating blocks was really the key modification that allowed Bitcoin to solve the previous problems uh, with, with digital money. So in our next few lectures, we'll discuss how these hashing systems and cryptographic systems work uh, and go more into depth on how exactly Bitcoin remains secure.